What a blessed, blessed truth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his help this evening. Oh, Father in heaven, you gave us your son. You gave us your son so that we could be reconciled to you. And Lord, in your holy word, you draw a picture of your son starting in the beginning and moving to the end. Lord, I pray for us tonight that we would see him clearly in the pages of your word, that you would grant us the grace that we need to understand your word. Lord, I pray that your word would be clear tonight. Lord, we need your help. So come to us and assist us, I pray, and I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. We are here for our last book of the Old Testament. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Malachi? And we are going to be reading about the oracle of the word of Yahweh to Israel through Malachi. And we've been reading about Old Testament prophets for more than four months now. We have four major prophets. Their writings are longer and more exhaustive. And then we had 12 minor prophets, equally important, but their, their words are shorter, more terse. And they say many, many things from many different perspectives, but there's a common thread that runs through all of these. Old Testament prophets. And that is that even though Israel was unfaithful to God and that God would discipline them severely for their unfaithfulness, God was faithful to his covenant with Israel. And you see that again and again and again. Some of these Old Testament prophets spoke at length about the details of what would take place in the future that God would use to fulfill his covenant promises. And others put their focus on Israel and their behavior and their sin and the consequence for their sin. But God wanted Israel to know two things in his writing in the Old Testament. He wanted them to know, first, you have rejected me and you need to repent. And secondly, he wanted them to know that one day I will restore you to your land and that Messiah is coming and he will reign over the whole earth. He wanted them to know those two things and that was very, very important. And as we get to the last book in the Old Testament, what we have here is God's summary of that. And we see once again that he's going to be speaking about Israel's unfaithfulness and he's going to be talking about his faithfulness to his own purpose. So what I want to do here is go once more through the setting and the timeline and we can understand exactly where it is that Malachi sits. And that would be very helpful for us as we think about some of the verses as we read through the book. We know that Israel was deported. Uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, was deported around 600 B.C. Three separate deportations into Babylon. The first at about 605 and then again in 598 and then again in, in 587 or so. And we know that they stayed there for 70 years. And about 538 B.C. they came back and they began to rebuild the temple. And then there was some opposition and there was some apathy internally as well. And so the temple sat there for quite a while. And as we've heard recently in Zechariah and Haggai, uh, those two prophets were very useful in Israel resuming the work on the temple. And the temple was actually finished sometime later, about 520 BC. About 70 years went past, 60 or 70 years, and Ezra actually returns to Judah at about 458. And then a few years after that, in 455 or so, Nehemiah returns. Malachi is probably about 450 BC, somewhere between 450, 430 BC, somewhere in there. So he is quite a while after the preaching and the prophecy of Haggai and Zechariah. That's important for us to know because there was an initial turning uh, among those after the, the words of those two prophets and a, a good spiritual restoration had taken place. And there's very good reason to believe that the temple worship and the sacrifices were reinstituted and the people were being faithful for some time. But 70 years is a long time, and we know how Israel's track record goes. We know that it's very easy for them to fall away. And they weren't even under their own rule at this time. They were under the rule of the Persians. And so there were lots of other influences in their, their lives. And very gradually, but very certainly and very surely, Israel descended into the same sin uh, that they were exiled for just a couple of hundred years earlier. I want us to turn to Ezra chapter 8, and we'll get a picture of what is actually happening in the state of Israel at about this time. 
This is the state of Judah as Ezra arrives back. And again, this is sometime around 460 B.C. Ezra chapter 8, verse 35. I'm going to be speaking here about sacrifices and animals that are offered in the sacrifice. The exiles had come from the captivity. They offered burnt sacrifices to the God of Israel. Twelve bulls for all of Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, 12 male goats for a sin offering, all as a burnt offering to the Lord. So it, it sounds really good. The end of Ezra chapter 8 sounds really, really good. But when we get to chapter 9 and we read the first verse, we find out that there's a systemic problem in Israel. And we find out that it's, it's very sobering because it's being led by the priests. Ezra 9 verse 1. When these things had been completed, the princes approached me, this is Ezra speaking, saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands. They have not separated themselves. There was intermarriage going on, and that was clearly forbidden under God's law. So here's the, the state of Israel. The priests are leading them into sin around this time. The focus here in, these, uh, in this last book is going to be a set of six different disputes that God has with Israel. So our outline is going to follow six disputes and then one conclusion for us. And in the pattern of these disputes, uh, God is going to make a claim against Judah. And then Judah is going to respond almost every time by saying, well, how? And then God is going to substantiate or prove his claim. And again, they establish two things in this dispute. One is that Israel has been disobedient and unfaithful. And the second thing is that God is going to be faithful to his covenant to them. So what we're going to see is that God tells Israel, you need to recognize my love. You need to honor me. You need to be faithful. You need to put your hope in me. You need to obey me and you need to fear me. Those are God's six disputes with Israel, with Judah. We're going to dig into those. So the first of those starts at the beginning of the first chapter. We're going to look at verse 2, and I'm going to go through verse 5. This is the second verse in the whole book, and God comes right out with them, right out the gate. He says, I have loved you, says Yahweh, but you say, how have you loved us? And then God responds by saying, was not Esau, Jacob's brother, declares Yahweh, Yet I have loved Jacob. So here's God's declaration to Israel. I have loved you. Judah knows this. It's nothing new. They know this. Uh, Deuteronomy 4 tells us in verse 37, this is Moses writing, because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them. And he personally brought you from Egypt by his great power. Because he loved your fathers. So Moses is making reference back to the patriarchs. So God has loved Israel from the patriarchs. He also loved them during their rebellion. Many centuries later, in Hosea chapter 11, towards the end of that book, God speaks to Israel again and he says, Yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of a man with bonds of love. And I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws, and I bent down and I fed them. So God has always loved these people. He has disciplined them severely because of their sin, but he has always loved them. And Israel gives us, and their response that they make to God's assertion and God's claim, gives us a really good picture of where they are with regard to their sin. They respond in verse 2 by saying, How have you loved us? God is claiming that he loved them, and they say, how? Israel is so distant from God, they don't even have a sense of his love for them. And so we have to consider that they were so sinful that God sent them into exile for 70 years. But while they were there, God prospered them. And God returned them, and he brought them back to their land, and he allowed them to rebuild their temple. He allowed them to rebuild a wall around Jerusalem so they could protect themselves. And he allowed them to resume their worship of him. That is kind of him to do that. What that does is that allows them to function with the original task that God gave them. I want you to be a light to all of the pagan Gentile nations around you. That's very loving of God. Israel says, how have you loved us? It's right there in front of them. But God doesn't respond by pointing to their present situation. Rather, he responds by taking them back to the beginning. 
back to their origin. And he says, was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares Yahweh. Yet I have loved Jacob. What God is doing here is he is putting his covenant with them in view. He goes all the way back to what every Jew should know, that God loved Jacob, the secondborn, and he hated Esau, the firstborn. Rather than giving Esau what was rightfully his, God is saying, I gave it to you. And here, when God speaks of love and hate, he's not talking about an emotional sense of attraction towards them. He's saying here that what I've done is I have taken and I have chosen you, Judah, for a covenant relationship rather than Esau. And this was a one-time choice that God made way back then, and it had implications all the way into the future, into the present. And we see that in verse 4. God is ongoing in his faithfulness and his love to Israel, even with Edom's disposition. Edom says in verse 4, Though Edom says, we have been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down. And men will call them the wicked territory and the people towards whom Yahweh is indignant forever. So God is saying, there's nothing that Edom can do to change my disposition to you. They may build their place, they may build themselves up, but I will tear them down. And I will prove that you are my choice and that I am for you. And God ends this section, this dispute in verse 5. We look at that and he says, Your eyes will see this and you will say, Yahweh be magnified beyond the border of Israel. God is not speaking to the present day residents who are under Malachi's prophecy here. He's speaking about future Israel. And they will see God's love for them played out in very real terms. And their response will be for the greatness of God's name to be known all over the world. God is saying, I will love you and I will love you so much that you will respond to me and you will put my, my name and my nature and my character on display to the nations. So at the end of the first dispute, what Israel should know is that God has loved them and they need to recognize his love for them. But God continues in his second dispute and he says, you need to honor me. One of the most important things you can do is honor me. He declares that he's worthy of Israel's honor in verse 6. And he says, As a son honors his father and a servant his master, then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? Says Yahweh of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, How have we despised your name? Look at where the focus of the dispute is here. It's to you, O priests, who despise my name. God's issue is with the priests and that they have no respect for him. And God puts two relationships in front of them. He puts in front of them the father-son relationship, and he puts in front of them the master-slave relationship. If the priests see a father-son relationship, then where is their honor for God? A son should honor his father. And if the priests see a master-slave relationship, then where is their respect for God? A slave should have respect and reverence for their master. And God is telling the priests, I have loved you, but you don't show me any honor, and you don't show me even the respect that is due to me. And these are the priests. This is really sad because it was their task to lead Israel in worship of God. And they don't honor God, and they don't respect him. And so God's argument goes to show how how hard-hearted they were. And God says, you even despise my name. When you think of my name, there's nothing that comes up but you wanting to despise me for that name. And we know that any priest, when he considers sacrifices, knows that the sacrifices need to be an unblemished sacrifice that is given. And the priests ask, how have we despised your name? So God spells it out for them. He spells it out for them in verse 7. He says, you are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? In that you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised. And remember again, it's the priests who are saying this. And God demands an unblemished lamb. We go back and we look at God's design for the sacrifices. Oh my Why don't you turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 1, while I get organized here. 
God says in Deuteronomy 17, I have a plan for you and I have a design for you and how it is that my sacrifices are to be presented to me. God says something about the nature and the quality of that sacrifice. He says, you shall not sacrifice to Yahweh your God an ox or a sheep which has a blemish or any defect, for that is a detestable thing to Yahweh your God. Do not offer an offering that has a blemish. And then back in our context, in chapter 1, verse 8, God says, but when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And you, when you present the lame or the sick, is it not evil? So what we have here is we have this, the priests and they're accepting blind and lame sacrifices. And we want to make sure we understand why it is that that's evil and why it is that that's sinful. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the point of an unblemished sacrifice? And the whole point of one is to point to God's design for salvation. Because sinful man can be reconciled to a holy God only through an offering of an innocent sacrifice. And so the unblemished lamb or ox or whatever else was to represent the fact that there would need to be an, a sinless, perfect sacrifice offered in their place. And the priests were missing this. They were not getting this at all. Their system of sacrifice was saying God's wrath will be satisfied by a sinful sacrifice. That's very offensive to God. And that's exactly what eternal condemnation is. It's the attempt by a sinful being, an imperfect sacrifice, to appease and satisfy the wrath of a holy God, the infinite wrath. It will last forever because the sacrifice itself or the subject itself is not unblemished. And the priests were willfully overseeing these sacrifices. And God gives them his response in verse 8. He says, Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates, that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. God is saying it is useless for you to do this. This is so offensive to God that to have no sacrifice would be better than to have a sacrifice offered like this. And here God points again to a day when he will receive the esteem and the honor that he deserves. And we see that in verse 11. From the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name will be great. Not just here in the Holy Land, but among the nations. In every place, incense is going to be offered to my name and a grain offering that is pure, for my name will be great among the nations. The honor problem at the present time is localized to Judah. But God is so worthy of honor that one day there will not be a place on earth that does not give proper tribute to him. So God condemns the actions of the priest and he censures their attitudes also towards these sacrifices. First he had a problem with their actions and now he has a problem with their attitudes. And that's, we see that in verse 13. The priests say, my, how tiresome it is. And God says, you disdainfully sniff at it. The priests thought so little of the sacrificial system that it had become wearisome to them. There was no humility or brokenness or grief over their sin. It had become so perfunctory and meaningless to them that rather than being soberly encouraged towards holiness of life, they descended into a lethargy and an indifference over their sin and the sacrifice. It, it actually had no meaning for them. And God hates this activity. So in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 2, he warns them. He says, if you do not listen and if you do not take it to heart to give honor to me, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. And indeed, I have cursed them already because you are not taking it to heart. God is saying, if you continue in this practice, then I will bring upon you the curses. Can we go to the... Sometimes you just have to give up. <laughs> All right, how are we doing so far? Much better. All right, let's try this. Okay, so God is saying, I have curses in store for you. And every priest and every prophet should be thinking back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. That, verse is a, uh, that chapter is a long chapter. There's 68 verses in that chapter. And the first 15 verses talk about God's blessing to his people. But the remaining 53 verses talk about God's curses if they disobey. 
and when they disobey. And God was saying, because you have ignored me already and you've ignored my command, I have cursed you already. And this rebuke is particularly humiliating to the priests. And the reason why it's humiliating to them is because God says, I am going to spread refuse on your faces of your descendants. And he says that in verse three. I am going to rebuke your offspring, will spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your feast, and you will be taken away with it. And the refuse that's in view here is what's left over from the burnt offerings after everything is burned. It's the part that, that is useless. It's the part that has no function, no use for anything. And God is saying, I will take that part and I will spread that on your faces. And God is going to wipe that on the faces of the descendants of Levi. And he's saying, if you continue in this pattern of sin, then I will declare you to be useless. And I will discontinue your place of service in my sacrificial system. And I will effectively be done with you. And then God puts the standard of the original Levite priest in front of them so they can understand just how far it is that they've fallen from their sin. And we see that in verse 5. It's a longer passage here, but we want to read it just so we have our understanding of what it was that the Levite priests were supposed to be doing. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him as an object of reverence. So he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was on his mouth and righteousness was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and righteousness and uprightness, and he turned many back from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge and men should seek instruction from his mouth for he is the messenger of Yahweh of hosts. So God is putting in front of them exactly what it is that a, a Levite priest is supposed to do. He gives a long list. They had reverence for God. They stood in awe of God's name. They gave true instruction, good instruction, clear instruction. They were free from unrighteousness. God is saying, this is my design. This is what you should have been doing. Verse 7, he should be the kind of man who others seek instruction from him. And we see particularly that's the point at which God disagrees with the current priest in Malachi's time. In verse 8, but as for you, you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by the instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says Yahweh of hosts. The priests of Malachi's day were nothing like the original Levite priests in their character. They were the exact opposite of what they were supposed to be. Rather than providing good instruction, clear instruction, the priest caused others to stumble by their instruction. So that's where they were. So God's judgment is on them, and we see that in verse 9. God says, So I also have made you despised and abased before all the people. So what God does there is, he puts in front of them the reason why he's going to make them despised in front of all of the people. Because you are not keeping my ways, but you are showing partiality in the instruction. So they have this instruction and they're applying their instruction unevenly to the people. They're showing partiality in it. They were favoring some sheep over others in their instructions. And that's actually absolutely what the priests are not supposed to do. And so God's consequence for them was to remove the people's esteem for them. And that's an easy way out. God is letting them off really easily because God has stern instructions and stern consequences in store for the, the Levite priests who are unfaithful. Numbers 18.32 says, You shall not profane the sacred gifts of the sons of Israel or you will die. The consequences for being an unfaithful priest before God were severe. And here God was letting them off pretty easily in this way. So God's next dispute with them has to do with Israel's unfaithfulness in their covenant relationship with God. And it takes place primarily inside the household. And this is a, a good place for us to take a look and see that God not only cares about how Israel is functioning and in an outward sense, he cares very much about how they're functioning inwardly in the privacy of their own homes. And we're going to see this in two areas inside the household. In one area, Israel had intermarried. And in another area was the issue of divorce and the way that it was being used. And this section starts differently than most of the other disputes that God has with them, where there's a question and a response and another question. Here, Malachi himself asks three questions. 
And he says, do we not all have one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously each against his brother so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? His questions are really amounting to a statement where he says, we have one God. We have the God, the only God. He's the God of Israel. So why are we violating the covenant that he gave us? We see some details about that in verse 11. Judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem for Judah has profaned the sanctuary of Yahweh, which he loves and has married the daughter of a foreign God. This probably means that these people were intermarrying at a particular level that was particularly offensive to God. So God is putting in front of them their intermarriage, not just any intermarriage, but it's the intermarriage with a daughter of a foreign God. It probably means that they were marrying women who were involved in some kind of pagan temple worship that was in some kind of religious system that was used in Persia in that day. And they were bringing all the influence of that into their Hebrew families. Deuteronomy chapter 7, God is clear about this. He says, furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons from following me to serve other gods. God was very jealous for the worship of his people. So he says, if you intermarry, this is what is going to happen. They will give your affections to another god. And that's exactly what happened. But that wasn't their only household sin. We see the next one in verse 13. And it starts with their complaint that God doesn't accept their worship and their offerings. And there's weeping and there's groaning in view here on the part of the the people. And again, their lostness keeps them from seeing their situation rightly. They say to God, why would you not accept our offerings? Verse 14, yet you say, for what reason? And God gives the answer. Because Yahweh has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Notice that God himself is the witness against Judah in this. So what was Judah doing here? The men were dealing treacherously with their wives. If they were unhappy with their wife for some reason, they violated their marriage covenant and they sent her away. They would just dump the woman. They would write her a certificate of divorce and send her away. And she consequently had no means of supporting herself. And all of this was because the husband wanted something else. God's response in verse 16 is very clear and very obvious. He says, divorce was never part of my design. I'm continuing in my faithfulness to you and you are unfaithful to me, even in your own homes. Never mind your your witness to the nations around you. Look inside your own home and you're unfaithful to me there. And what you see in verse 16 is the Malachi version of our wellspring theme verse, Proverbs 4, 23, that says, guard your heart with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life. What we have in Malachi, we have a, a rough parallel to that. He says, so take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. And take heed to your spirit does not mean follow the counsel of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The the Holy Spirit was not indwelling inside of people at that time. What he's saying is follow the testimony of my law that you have within you. You know my law. I gave it to you. This is how you guard yourself from dealing treacherously. Observe my law. So Israel didn't believe in God's love for them. They didn't honor God and they were unfaithful to the covenant that God gave them. Those are the first three of those disputes. And God's next three disputes have to do with their disposition towards God. And the first of those has to do with their lack of trust or their lack of hope in God. And so God speaks about that in verses 17 of chapter 2 through verse 6 of chapter 3. Malachi writes, You have wearied Yahweh with your words, yet you say, How have we wearied him in that you say everyone who does evil is good in the sight of Yahweh and he delights in them? Or where is the God of justice? So we have this same pattern again where God brings the claim, you're wearying me with your words. And Israel and Judah responds and they say, how? Tell me how. And then God gives them the answer. 
And Judah is seeing evil in the world. We see that everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. What Israel and what Judah is seeing here is the prosperity of the pagan nations. And they're questioning God about that. And what this does is this presents blindness to them on two counts. We can see their own blindness so clearly here. First, because they're forgetting the lessons of the past. The Psalms are full of passages that describe how we are to respond when others, we see success and we see prosperity in the ungodly. Psalm 73 is one of those. Asaph is writing, he says, I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He recognizes the sin of his own heart. He recognizes that it's sinful for him as he sees the prosperity of the sinful. But if you go farther on in Psalm 73, you see where he takes himself and where he ends up. Verses 16 and 17. Then I pondered to understand this. It was troublesome in my sight until I came to the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. Asaph comes to the sanctuary of God which means that he respects and resets his perspective to be that of God's covenant relationship with his own people. He's thinking about God's covenant relationship with them. And then he sees clearly, he sees everything with the right and the proper perspective when he's thinking about things in light of God's covenant relationship with his own people. But Judah here does no such thing. They don't put their hope in God's faithfulness, even though they had testimony before them. It's been in place for hundreds of years. And the second way that this shows their blindness as they they question God about the prosperity of others is they're looking and overlooking their own sin. Where they say at the end of verse 17, where is the God of justice? When God's justice would have demanded that he consume them, if he was just with them. These are sinful people and God is being patient and patient and patient, very merciful to them. So they're totally blind to their own sin when they bring this charge to God and in their response to him. And God's response to this is to give them the clearest picture of the future that we see in this whole book. And he does it in two parts. He gives them the near-term picture and he gives them the long-term picture. And uh, God recognizes that their lack of trust in God, even though there's nothing more powerful and more binding than God's covenant to them. So he tells them what he's going to do and that he's going to send them a messenger. This is chapter three, verse one, where he tells them, behold, I am going to send you my messenger and he will clear the way before me. And Yahweh, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says Yahweh of hosts. Isaiah told Judah about this 250 years earlier. Isaiah chapter 40, verse three. The voice is calling, clear the way for Yahweh in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. So Israel was told that Yahweh would be coming. Jesus identifies this person who would make clear this path as John the Baptist. He says that in Matthew 11, verses 9 and 10. Jesus said, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. And one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. So God has a response to Israel when they come to him and they say all of these things to him. God says to them, you are unfaithful to keep my covenant with you, but you don't believe that I will be faithful to it. So I will give you the details of what I'm going to do. Make ready the way of the Lord means that this one will come in humility. This one will come in humility because he will need the way to be prepared for him. He will need the way to be straightened for him when he comes. That's clearly a reference to the earthly ministry of Jesus that would come in the New Testament 400 years later. So God tells them there is a near-term solution to this, but he also tells them about a far-term solution. And you see that in verses two and three, where he says, who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to Yahweh offerings in righteousness. Here God is telling them about the day of his coming. This is pointing to the distant future, a time that is future from us now. And we see that when he says, who can stand? 
He speaks of a refiner's fire where people are going to be consumed by fire. Others are going to be refined by it. A fuller's soap, that which cleanses some that need to be cleansed. Smelter and purifier, all of these things are speaking of the day of the Lord. They refer to what Jesus will do in his second coming when he comes to establish his rule and his reign on the earth. In verse 4, Jesus tells Judah that they will be restored to a position of favor with God, which is a really sobering statement to them in view of what they don't have at that present time. He says, Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to Yahweh as in the days of old, as in former years. God is saying, I can't stand your offerings today. They are so distasteful. They are so offensive. They weary me. However, in that day, they will be pleasing to me. Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to Yahweh. Their offerings will be. So that's encouraging to them. And God is saying, you don't believe I will do this, but I'm telling you that I will. And he provides some really strong statements in verse 5 that help us understand that. He says, then I will draw near to you for judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and adulterers, those who swear falsely, those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, those who oppress the widow, those who oppress the orphan, those who turn him aside and do not fear me. God is saying there is a certain future event coming. That's the near term event. And that's my son's earthly ministry. And you must look forward to that with confidence. You see all of this in front of you that looks like injustice. Look forward to the coming of my son. But moreover, he says, there's a further future event coming when my son will avenge my wrath on the sinful. And you must look forward to that with confidence as well. And because of those two future events, you must obey me. And that's the subject of his next dispute with the people. He says, obey me. And he says that in verses 7 through 12 of chapter 3. He starts by saying, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. And again, Israel responds by saying, how? How have we done that? And God says, it's in tithes and offerings. It's very important for us to understand a little bit about the tithes and the offerings. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take us to a, a passage that was written post-exile that explained the tithes and the offerings. So it's fairly current to them. And it's 2 Corinthians. Sorry, that would be really far. Let's try 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 31. Chronicles were written after the return from the exile so that the tribe of Judah would understand that they are the people of God and God is going to be faithful to his promise. Part of what he included in that was a reiteration of the tithe system so they would understand what it was that they were supposed to do for their priests. So 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verse 4. Also, he commanded the people who lived in Jerusalem to give the portion due to the priests and the Levites that they might devote themselves to the law of Yahweh. The portion there was one-tenth of the produce of the field and of the livestock, and it was to be given to the Levites for their daily needs. God isn't saying to them, you don't pay your bills. What God is saying to them is something that has spiritual significance. He's saying, my purpose for the tithe is that you provide material livelihood for those who are supposed to lead you in worship. It is a big task to lead this nation and this people in worship. And you are supposed to provide their needs for their needs while they do that. But you have rejected that. Worshiping me means so little to you that you're not willing to provide for my servants with what they need so that they can lead you. And you see more of, a, more of a rebuke of that in verse 10. It shows how little they trusted God for their provision. God says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says Yahweh of hosts. He says, try me and test me and see if I will be faithful. And then he says, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. God is telling them, don't trust in your own ability to provide and for yourself. Trust in my ability to provide for you and take the first step in taking care of your own priests when you do that. God says, you have not obeyed me and you have not honored me. And now he says, you have not feared me. And that's the sixth and last of his disputes with his people. Their failure to fear him. And again, you see the same ignorance in Judah 
God says, you have been arrogant against me. And they say, us? Arrogant? How? And God replies, you have said in verse 14 of chapter 3, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his charge and that we have walked in mourning before Yahweh of hosts? God has two complaints against them. One is, they've said, serving God is vain. It is vain to serve him. And secondly, there is no profit, there's no benefit, there's no gain in keeping his law. Notice how Judah is actually indicting themselves when they say this. When they say it's vain to serve you, what they're proving there is that their own disobedience to God was empty. It was meaningless to them. It was providing them with no benefit. The reason why there was no benefit was because they were disobedient in the first place. It was devoid of any relationship with God. So God is saying, of course, obedience seems vain to you because a relationship with me is vain to you. But there will always be a remnant of believers in Israel. And sometimes it's pretty small and it probably was pretty small in Malachi's day. And we see an evidence of that in verse 16. And this is really sweet. Those who feared Yahweh spoke to one another and Yahweh gave attention and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear Yahweh and who esteem his name. And it's really unclear whether an actual scroll was in view here. I'm not really sure about that, but what there is no doubt of is the fact that godly ones were there and they were talking to one another. They spoke to one another. And there's no doubt that God saw this and he understood this. And God says in verse 17, they will be mine, says Yahweh of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possession and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. This again is, is very, very apocalyptic. And God is speaking of a day when he prepares his own possession. Israel is not in a condition to serve him at this time. So he is going to prepare them in the future. And he will make for himself an obedient portion, a subset of Israel, and they will serve him. And it's clear from verse 18, where God says, you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve them. And this is a rebuke to those who disobey, but it is a true comfort to those who are faithful and obedient to him. And God closes this dispute with his statement of the judgment that will come on the day of the Lord. And it is starting with a warning to the unbeliever in chapter four, verse one. God says, behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day will set them ablaze so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. God is saying that there is a day coming when God will consume all of those who are disobedient to him. But verse two has comfort for the faithful. And again, God has his covenant promises to Israel in view here. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. In the midst of all of this sin, God is showing Judah again, I will be faithful to you. I will be faithful to you in my covenant promises to you. And this is a clear statement of what will take place in Israel during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So with the millennial reign of Christ in view, Malachi tells Judah what to do now. And it's just what we would expect. And we see that in verses four through six of chapter four. He says, remember the law of Moses, my servant. So he tells them, remember my law, know my law, remember it with an intent to obey it. And remember that I am faithful and persevere. That perseverance is important because you see in verse five, God says, I am going to send you Elijah, the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of Yahweh. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Now God spoke of John the Baptist back at the beginning of chapter three in verse one, where he says, I'm gonna send you my messenger and he'll clear the way before me. Again, that's a reference to Jesus earthly ministry and the preparation that John gave for Jesus earthly ministry. But God is speaking of a time here when no such help is needed because it is a great and terrible day of the Lord. We see that at the end of verse five. 
And God has parting words for Israel. It's on the the front end of 400 years of silence. And and they have to do with generation after generation after generation of Jews having hearts that are restored to one another. And the emphasis here really is not on a familial unity. It's more on a national unity where generation after generation after generation, you have people Jewish people living in a right relationship with God because they have a right heart towards him. So that's the way that God ends his Old Testament. His testimony is, I have a covenant relationship with you and I will keep it with you and I will be faithful. He doesn't give them parameters into the future in some cases, but he will be faithful. So what we need to do is we need to ask ourselves um, a couple of points of application And one point of application for us is it's good for us to remind ourselves of what God's covenant promises to Israel means for Gentiles today. What difference should it make to us that God is going to keep his promises to the Gentiles? It's helpful for us to think about a passage that is in the New Testament. It's at the very end of our Bibles. It's in Revelation 19. It describes Jesus coming to set up his rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. He says, the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. These are Gentile saints, ones who've been raptured away. They've been with Christ for seven years in the clouds, and they are coming with Christ. They are attending with Christ as Christ is going to declare and accomplish victory over the Antichrist. And he's going to set up his rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. So it's important for us to remember that that day is coming that every Gentile believer in Christ will be raptured away to be with Christ. And then we will come back here to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And the second point of application with that first point of application in view is what is our responsibility today? My small group got finished with studying second Peter just a short while ago. And the way Peter ends the letter chapter three, verses 11 and 12 Since all these things are be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening for the coming of the day of God? Because of all of God's promises to Israel, because of his character to keep his promise to them, his covenant promises to them, what it means for us as believers for the future, what sort of people should we be today? Well, Peter tells us we should be people who have holy conduct. We should be people who run hard after godliness. So when we think back on 16 books of Old Testament prophecy, where God makes his promise to the Hebrew people that I will keep my promises to you, that means an awful lot for the Jew. And it means an awful lot for the Gentile too. And that we should remember that we will be there. And we should remember that in the meantime, we should be full of a pursuit of holiness and godliness. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your Old Testament. Lord, you showed us in your word that you chose a people and you took them out of their sin and out of their false gods and out of their pagan worship and you created a people for yourself. And you gave them a perfect law, a law which showed them that they needed a savior, one who would permanently remove their sin from them. And Lord, with increasing clarity as the books go by and as time goes by, centuries, you gave an increasingly clear picture of your son. Lord, the one who would come, we praise you for his earthly ministry in which he came and he taught the true gospel. He preached the true gospel. And then as an innocent sacrifice, he went to a cross to absorb within his own body, your wrath against everybody who would put their trust in him. We know Jesus, that you are coming again. We know that you will come again. And you will accomplish everything you intend. You are the one who is the rightful heir of this earth. I pray for us that we would be mindful of that. That this week, as we pursue the tasks that we do at work, or in our homes, or in our neighborhoods, that you would grant us wisdom, Lord, to see how it is that we should run hard after holiness of life, so that the rest of the world can see that we have trusted in your son and are eagerly awaiting his return. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.